Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Maggie and for the next hopefully less than 20 minutes, I will be your tutor. If you're new to the channel, that's what we do here. Me and my brother John are former MCAT tutors and now we're just kind of giving out all the resources for free on YouTube. So we were uh, really going ham on this high yield series uh, where we kind of cover the most high yield topics on the MCAT, the most high yield sciences, kind of go through how the MCAT tests them and everything. And then we kind of got sidetracked because the AAMC dropped a new pr free practice exam. And that's kind of like what we do here is we go through the AAMC practice exams and give you better explanations as to why answer choices are wrong or right and kind how to think about them. So definitely go check those out if that's something that you think you'd be interested in. But we're trying to kind of light up the high yield series again. And today we're going to be going over a really big topic, which is protein structure and organization. If you like these high yield videos, then you will love, love, love um, our high yield book that we spent all summer making. <laughs> It basically goes through all the high yield sciences, just like I'm doing now, but it's in a written form. It has some really cool professional um, illustrations and everything. And if you um, buy the bundle on our website, then it comes with like an Anki deck so that you can test yourself on these high yield sciences every day. So it's really, really cool. And you guys should definitely go check it out. I'll put the link in the description below, as well as the link to literally everything else we've ever done. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and get into protein structure. So what I mean when I talk about protein structure is like, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. And these should be terms that you're familiar with if you've taken like biochemistry or even some, some biology classes or chemistry classes to touch on this. I pulled this graphic from our book to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about as we go through it. But just as an outline, primary structure um, kind of looks like this and it, it's very the most simple, I would say, of the of the structures to understand. Secondary structure, we're going to kind of be covering alpha helixes and beta sheet, beta pleated sheets briefly. Tertiary structure actually has a lot of things that go under it, and we are going to touch on those because that's typically how it gets tested. And then quaternary structure we'll briefly talk about because it's not as high yield. So primary structure. Primary structure is literally which amino acids are sitting next to each other. And that is going to be extremely important when we start to look at tertiary structure and how the protein folds upon itself. So primary structure affects everything downstream of it. It affects secondary structure and uh, tertiary structure and quaternary structure. So if you mess with primary structure, then you're going to be messing with all those downstream things and you're going to end up with a, a protein that looks like crap or looks like not like it's supposed to. It's not going to fold right and therefore... It's not going to work right. So a lot of times what the MCAT will do is they will give you this string of letters and what they're doing is telling you the primary structure of that protein. They're telling you that there's a serine right here. There's a tyrosine right here. There's an aspartic acid, glutamic acid. I think I'm getting this right. But if you think about applications, like if you get a point mutation in the primary structure and it's no longer this and it's instead this, they replaced it with a phenylalanine then it completely changes the way that that protein is going to interact with the rest of the big long string. We're going to come back to that when we talk about tertiary structure, but just know that things like point mutations are very important for primary structure. Primary structure of proteins is what they're talking about. And again, one last time, primary structure is just which amino acids are sitting next to each other. How do, how do they appear in the polypeptide? Moving on to secondary structure, the important thing for secondary structure, you're going to hear it talked about as the like local interactions. And that is an important thing to realize that that's the language people use to describe it. But that's not really how I like to describe it. I like to say it is the hydrogen bonds between the backbones of the amino acid chain. So I've put uh, two amino acids right here um, just with like random R groups because the R groups don't matter for secondary structure. Secondary structure is all about backbone interactions. So you're going to have this hydrogen bond right here and hydrogen bonds are relatively strong. So these are good, strong interactions. The two types of secondary structure that you can have is alpha helix and beta pleated sheets. Y'all can break these down into different types of alpha helices and different types of beta pleated sheets, but the MCAT's not really going to do that. Um, that's very low yield. So if we come down here, I will start with alpha helix because I think it's easier to uh, explain. This figure looks kind of busy, but really, if you if you look at what they've illustrated here, the orange lines are the hydrogen bonds um, of the alpha helix. And you can see that this is the carbonyl here of the amino acid. And specifically for amino acids down the coil, it will hydrogen bond with that amine group. 
So that is a number that you want to remember probably. It's four amino acids. Every four amino acids, there is a hydrogen bond. That's kind of how it is in an alpha helix. I don't really think that it's important to know like um, how many like angstroms long or anything that an alpha that each like pitch on an alpha helix is or whatever. I would just keep four in your mind. Every four amino acids, there's a hydrogen bond. And I, I don't want to be misunderstood here. Like you can like you can have more hydrogen bonds. It, at least I'm pretty sure you can have more hydrogen bonds. Like you can theoretically like hydrogen bond every single amino acid backbone. But I'm trying to say like. If this amino acid is number one, then we go one, two, three, four, and then there will be a hydrogen bond with that one. Like that's where the hydrogen bond is. Just want to make sure I'm clear on that. So now beta pleated sheets is the exact same interaction as you'll see. It is the carbonyl of one with the amine group of another, but it, 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 it doesn't have like a specific amount of amino acids that it has to be apart from one another or whatever. If you think about, I wish I had like a string or something, but if you think about like a long string, that's pretty much what, um, you know, a polypeptide or a string of amino acids, that primary structure, and then you start folding it on itself and you can even like fold it like an accordion to where you make a little string sandwich that's just going back and forth. Once each one of those little like loops that are going on top of one another, if the backbones of those amino acids start interacting with each other and hydrogen bonding with each other, then you're going to have a beta pleated sheet. And that's what you see here. Like this amino acid, you know, say that it's going in this direction, then t technically it goes all the way around and then it loops back and then it'll go like this. And maybe it goes all the way over here and then it loops back and then there's more hydrogen bonds right here and that would just be a beta pleated sheet. And that's kind of how that looks. Here, you can kind of see that. But like they loop like this. Now you can, you can kind of split hairs and say that, you know, they can loop like this or whatever and go in different directions. Um, and that would be when you're talking about parallel versus anti-parallel beta pleated sheets. That's very, like pretty low yield for the MCAT. You guys should definitely know it, um, but I'm not going to cover it in, in a high yield video like this. So that's secondary structure. What do you have to know from that? That it is backbone interactions and that it's all about hydrogen bonds. That's the most important thing for secondary structure. Tertiary structure is like the biggest one. Oh, wait, there was one more thing I wanted to say about secondary structure, and it has to do with the amino acid proline. If y'all will remember, the amino acid proline is weird. It has a weird structure like this where it like folds back on itself and can reconnects with that amine group. That makes proline like really an interesting geometry and an interesting like, they say a kinky shape. So specifically for alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets, if I was to have a point mutation that gave me a proline where I didn't have a proline before and it ended up that I had a weird proline in the middle of my alpha helix that would completely throw off the secondary structure. It would completely add a kink into that alpha helix, as they say. And so you don't want that. Often where you actually do see prolines is at the very beginning or end of an alpha helix. And I don't really know why that is. It just is. Now, beta pleated sheets, if you'll remember when I was drawing like this, you want a very, you want a kink right here. And so oftentimes you will see proline right there at the turns of the beta pleated sheets. So proline plays a very special role in secondary structure. But if you have a point mutation that gives you proline, it can really F up the secondary structure. So tertiary structure is similar to secondary structure in that it is amino acids interacting with each other, but it is specifically the side chains of the amino acids that are interacting with each other. And they can have a ton of different interactions and you do need to know them. The first one is hydrogen bonds. The second is disulfide bonds. The next one is hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions. The next one is ionic interactions. The next one is van der Waals. And the last one is proline kinks. So you should uh, at this point know what your R groups for all your proteins are, and you should be able to recognize that there are a lot of R groups that are able to hydrogen bond. Um, disulfide bonds is going to be your cysteine residues. Hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions are going to be like how um, isoleucine is hydrophobic and it likes to interact with phenylalanine, which is also hydrophobic. Ionic interactions is going to be opposite charges attracting. So an aspartic acid is going to go towards a leucine 
F. So an aspartic acid is going to go uh, towards a positively charged lysine or whatever. Van der Waals interactions are those little annoying interactions that you always have to consider, like the transient uh, dipole-dipole interactions. It's not necessarily something that's um, specific to one amino acid or over another, like all of them display Van der Waals interactions between their side chains. And then proline kinks, which we talked about with secondary structure, but they can also play a role in tertiary structure. So definitely, definitely, definitely know those interactions. These all contribute to tertiary structure. And when I say tertiary structure, I mean, um, I don't know if this is going to be like a good or a bad res representation, but you see how I just wadded up my phone charger? I could probably like never recreate this exact wadding up of my phone charger and my phone charger you know if we think about it in terms of like if this was a protein it could have like this part right here that's an alpha helix and a part over here that's a beta pleated sheet it, it could have all those within it but the 3d um kind of like representation of the protein is the tertiary structure and it is highly 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 unique and it's going to have these little divots in it that are going to fit with other proteins or if it's an enzyme it's going to fit with ligands um, or if it's a receptor it's going to fit with different things and it's going to have these little divots in it and if it's you know if it's an enzyme it's going to fit little substrates in there if it's a receptor it's going to fit little ligands in there and that very specific shape that the protein forms because of the specific interactions that the amino acids in the protein create with each other, that's going to give the protein its function form equals function. So yeah, I could like, you know, unwind it and denature it or whatever you want to call it and then wad it back up, but I have a completely different tertiary structure at this point. And if you think about how simple this thing is and how uh, complicated um, proteins are and how they have all these different charges and hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions and all this kind of stuff, then you're going to start to appreciate appreciating how unique proteins are and how a point mutation could really F up everything downstream. One other thing about tertiary structure is the hydrophobic effect. I think before I graduate med school, I should learn how to spell. So the hydrophobic effect refers to the tendency for hydrophobic uh, amino acids to kind of curl into the middle of the protein in the tertiary structure. And for the hydrophilic, um, wants to be on the outside. Now, why is that? Because it seems to me, if you're thinking about the laws of thermodynamics and you're thinking about how entropy or chaos or whatever you want to call it is always increasing, you would think that you'd want them just random, just everywhere. But what ends up happening, and I'll try to um, demonstrate on this little thing right here, is that if I have um, hydrophobic amino acids on the outside of my protein, and it is interfacing with, um, you know, the solution around it, which is most of the time going to be water. Water and hydrophobic amino acids don't mix. So what ends up happening is that you have this shell that forms around the hydrophobic proteins if they're on the outside of the protein. That water organizes itself in such a very, very specific way so as to kind of like keep its distance from the hydrophobic um, amino acids. And that specific order that water takes in order to create that kind of shell is actually way more order and way, I guess you could think of it like less entropy, is actually way more ordered than it would be if water could just go wherever it wanted because the hydrophobic amino acids are on the inside. So there, the hydrophobic effect of a protein folding in such a way that the hydrophobic as, amino acids are on the inside of the protein actually serves to increase entropy. So this is how it would be if the hydrophobic effect didn't occur. It kind of shows it as like two separate things, but you can kind of think about it as this is how it would be if the hydrophobic amino acids were on the outside of the protein. All this water has to get in this very specific formation to kind of surround those hydrophobic proteins in a way that doesn't upset either party. But if I push all the hydrophobic amino acids on the inside, then all that's left is hydrophilic stuff on the outside, and then water can do whatever the F it wants. And if it comes across like one little hydrophobic thing over here, then yes, it will have to form that little shell, but that is much preferred over having to 
form a shell around all of these hydrophobic amino acids. So it, the hydrophobic effect serves to increase entropy because we want to increase entropy. I think I said everything I want to say about tertiary structure. It's like the most tested one. So the difference between tertiary structure and secondary structure is that secondary structure is uh, between backbones of amino acids and it is local, meaning like it's not going to be a hundred amino acids away from each other. It's going to be ones that are relatively close to one another and it is the backbone and it is hydrogen bonding. Whereas tertiary structure can be any of these types of interactions. You have to think about the hydrophobic effect as well. And it actually creates like the 3D structure that makes proteins like so unique. So quaternary structure is how tertiary, like tertiary structure at that point, it's a, it's probably a fully functional protein. Like a lot of proteins are just tertiary structure, but a lot of them actually take multiple moieties is kind of what they call them and like smush them together. And they connect in different ways uh, through kind of like the same interactions that you see here. A lot of times it's disulfide bonds. They connect to give you a quaternary structure, which is basically just several moieties of proteins that have their own tertiary structure all connected to one another. So a lot of times where you'll see quaternary structure tested is for hemoglobin because it has two alpha and two beta subunits. So subunits is kind of like the word you want to look for. Subunits or moieties are kind of the words you want to look for for quaternary structure. Actually, I don't, I don't know that I would hang my hat on moieties because I feel like you could talk about different moieties in tertiary structure too. But subunits definitely is only going to be something that you see for quaternary structure. I think it's important to say that if it is a protein like hemoglobin that requires um, quaternary structure and that's going to have like subunits and stuff, it's not functional at the tertiary structure level. There are proteins that are functional at the tertiary structure level that are good on their own. They don't have to have anything else. But there are ones like hemoglobin and a lot of like receptors and stuff that require quaternary structure in order to be functional. So basically the proteins know what they're doing, but we're trying to work backwards to understand what they're doing. If you guys are confused about anything that I said, please drop a comment below and I will try to get back with that. I hope that I was clear and that I made everything easier instead of harder. Like I said, if you like anything that we do in these high yield videos, if you liked that figure that I was just working off of, then you'll love our high yield books. So go, you know, check it out in the link below. Other than that, I think I'm going to, film a walkthrough. So I will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.